Hey everyone, welcome back to physics. This will be lecture 17 of the course. And in this section, we're going to go through a handful of problems and examples that make use of Newton's laws of motion. And so we will do actually many more examples in the coming sections. We're gonna have a whole uh, range of lectures uh, called based basically applying Newton's laws. And so we'll, look, we'll tackle a variety of problems, but I did wanna give a couple more examples of using Newton's laws uh, just in a couple of, of kind of simple practice exercises just to remind us uh, of what we've learned so far uh, and to help prepare us uh, for the for the coming section. So let's jump into it. We'll call this section 3.6 problems and examples uh, again specifically of applying Newton's laws. So let's start with this example which I will call sliding block or we'll call it sliding crate actually. Okay, and so um, as <clears throat> as with before, I'm gonna I'll just lay out the problem, and then I would highly recommend pausing the video, trying to work out the problem on your own, and see if you can figure it out, and then turning it back on and and, and seeing uh, the the solution. Okay, so here's the first problem: a worker applies a horizontal force to push a 20 kilogram crate across a warehouse floor. So a worker applies a horizontal force to push a 20 kilogram crate across a warehouse floor. Okay, the coefficient of kinetic friction is 0 0.3, so I'm going to write mu sub mu sub k is equal to 0 0.3. Okay, the worker applies a force. The worker applies a force of 150 newtons. And the question is what is the crate's acceleration? Okay, so let's start with a free body diagram, All right? So the free body diagram. All right, so I've got a crate, which is represented as a box here. And of course the crate has a weight, mg. It's offset by the normal force, right? It's not falling through the floor, so it's presumably offset by the normal force. And there's a worker pushing on the thing, which we'll denote as F push. And there's some friction involved between the crate and the floor. There's some friction. And so I'm just going to draw a vector in the opposite direction. And I'm going to label it F fricked, friction. Now, I don't know for sure yet if there is a net force, whether the force of friction is exactly equal to the push uh, force or whether it's less or more. Um, the problem does ask what's the crate's acceleration, so it's likely that uh, the friction is less than the push. So, but until we know for sure, let's just draw it like this. So let's start to figure out what each of these things uh, is equal to. So let's start with the normal force. So we've got the normal force, which we can calculate as uh, m times the mass of the objects time times the uh, magnitude of gravitation, which so we get 20 kilograms is the mass of the crate and 9.8 meters per second squared. And so we see that the normal force is 196 newtons. Okay, what about, so once we have the normal force, we calculate the friction force, right? Because remember the friction, kinetic friction is a, is a, uh, a, a fraction of the normal force. Right, so let's see what the magnitude of the friction force is. We know that it's gonna be mu sub k, the kinetic uh, friction coefficient, times the magnitude of the normal force. Right, and so in this case, it's 0 0.3 times 196 newtons. 
and so we see that friction is about 58.8 newtons. All right. Okay. And now <clears throat> the friction force is in this direction. The force of the push, which is 150 newtons, is in that direction, the opposite direction. And so clearly there's going to be a net force in the x direction, and therefore we will have some acceleration. So what is that net force in the x direction? So we can just do this kind of thing if we want, the net force in the x direction. Well, we got 150 newtons to the right, and we've got 58.8 newtons to the left. So I'll just denote one using a negative sign. And so when we add those two together, we see that the net force must, must be about 91.2 newtons to the right, right, in the positive direction. So by Newton's first law, the object will be accelerating, right, because there is a net force. And specifically in this case, the object will be accelerating in the direction of the, um, of the push, of the worker's push. Okay. So using Newton's second law, we can identify that the, the size of that acceleration. So using Newton's second law, right? Second law, remember, is that the sum of the forces is equal to the mass times the acceleration, all right? And so that means the magnitude of the acceleration can be calculated as the sum of the magnitude of the forces divided by the mass. Okay, so in this case, we figured out the magnitude of the net force is 91.2 newtons, right? And we're gonna divide that by the weight, or sorry, the mass of the crate, not the weight, 20 kilograms. Okay, and so when we do that, we get 4.56 meters per second squared. Okay, so the crate is accelerating at 4.56 meters per second squared in the direction that the worker is pushing it. Okay, so kind of a simple problem, but a nice review just of where the laws all come into play in kind of a simple setup like this. Now, what about Newton's third law? Where does that come into the picture? Well, it's kind of off to the side, isn't it? It's not immediately relevant. Well, it's not immediately helpful. Newton's third law comes into the picture through the fact that the crate pushes back on the worker with an equal force of 150 newtons, right? So if the worker is applying 150 newtons to the crate, the crate's applying 150 newtons back to the worker, right? And another way it comes into, into, into this problem is through the normal force, right? The normal force always opposes the force of, an, of a body's weight, and so that really is a Newton's third law situation. The normal force is a result of the floor pushing back on the crate with a force equal to the force of the crate's weight pushing on the floor. Okay, so that's also third law. But really, we didn't need the third law to solve this problem. We just needed the first law to establish that it's accelerating and the second law to establish the magnitude of the acceleration. All right, let's do another example. Let's talk through another example. So this one um, is going to involve kind of a similar kind of problem, but it has a little bit of a kink in it. So a car of mass 1,000 kilograms is towing a trailer of mass 300 kilograms. Towing a trailer of mass 300 kilograms, nice round numbers. The car's engine exerts a forward force of 4,000 newtons. Four thousand newtons, okay. And the frictional force The frictional force acting on the car I'm gonna I'm gonna say the frictional force acting on the car slash trailer is 800 newtons and 200 newtons 
respectively. Okay, so both of them, I mean, there's some force, or sorry, there's some friction between the car and the road. There's also some friction between the trailer and the road, right? Um, <clears throat> okay, so 800 newtons and 200 newtons, respectively. Uh, calculate the acceleration of the car trailer system. Calculate the acceleration of the car trailer system. All right, so we're just, again interested in the acceleration. So let's talk through. So the, I think one of the things that is kind of can throw somebody. I mean, not, not not everybody, but some people could be thrown by the idea of this of this trailer and this car being like two bodies. Well, we can think of the car and the trailer really as a single body, right? So you've got you've got the car. and you've got a trailer behind it. And the two are connected, right? They're connected by, uh, you know, kind of the tongue of the trailer or the hitch of the car, however you want to think about it. Maybe it's both things. The two are connected, right? So we can think of the car and the trailer as a single body because the tension in the tongue of the trailer uh, is is are the only the tension in the trailer is only are the only horizontal forces acting on it right also if you recall from a previous section we talked about how if the mass of the rope between two bodies is very small relative to the to the bodies you can think of them as really just kind of transmitting the force right so you've got this tension operating in both directions equal and opposite and because the hitch is small relative to the size of the car and the trailer, we can kind of think of this thing as one body. Not two, right? Okay. And so that being the case, then the problem is actually relatively simple. And once you get past that, now that's not always going to be possible. Like sometimes sometimes you you know you're not going to be able to think about it like this for example if the if the rope stretched dramatically if the the connector between the trailer and the and the car were, was very stretchy or was extremely massive uh, you wouldn't be able to necessarily think about it like this but we can come up with a free body diagram now where we treat the trailer and the car as being the same body right so you got mg and you've got the normal force in a in alignment, right? Uh, the two, the car's not floating off. The car's not um, the car's not falling through the through the through the road. So those two are aligned. Now we've got the force of the engine. So I'll just denote that as F engine. And it says it's four thousand newtons, and it's obviously going to be in that direction. And then offsetting that is a friction force. And the friction force is really going to be the sum of the of the car and the trailer's friction, right? The car has a certain amount of friction. The trailer also has a certain amount of friction. That force is additive. And so it's going to be 200 newtons for the trailer plus 1,000 newtons, or sorry, 800 newtons for the car, so it's a total of 1,000 newtons. Okay, so you have 1,000 newtons in one direction, you got 4,000 newtons in the other direction. We obviously, uh, by Newton's first law, we're gonna have some acceleration. The system is, it, un, there's a net force in the x direction. Now the magnitude of the net force, let's see. <clears throat> so the sum of the forces is equal to the mass times the acceleration, and so that means that we've got 4,000 newtons in one direction plus negative 1,000 newtons, right? So 1,000 newtons in the other direction. That's gonna be equal to the mass of the car plus the trailer, which is what, 1,000 kilograms plus 300 kilograms. And that's gonna be times the acceleration, right? And so then just doing the arithmetic here, 
we can see that the magnitude of the acceleration will be equal to 3,000 newtons. This piece here divided by 1,300 kilograms. Right, and so we can see that it's 2.31 meters per second squared. Okay. <clears throat> So in this case, really, it's a very similar problem to the last problem, friction versus some force. Um, but the difference here is that you sort of technically have accounting for two separate bodies that you have, uh, you, you, you kind of uh, assemble into, the, into, into a single body because of the nature of the problem, right? Because it's a trailer and a car, and they definitely accelerate together. You know, when you put your brakes on in the car, the trailer instantly slows down, right? So, and when you floor the car, the trailer accelerates uh, at the same exact pace. It keeps perfect pace with the car. There's no flexibility or any of that. So that is why we can make such a simplifying assumption on the trailer. Okay, let's do one more problem. We'll do one more problem and then call it good for this section. So here's the last problem. Again, I recommend after the after I read the problem through and have it written down, pause the video, try to work it out. So let's imagine a small rocket in space. Imagine a small rocket in space and far away from any significant gravitational field. So take that as an assumption. Uh, the rocket has a mass of 500 kilograms. Okay. And is initially at rest. All right. Now, the rocket is going to expel gas out of out of the rear of the rocket, right? So it's got some kind of a rocket booster, some kind of an engine, some thruster, or, or whatever, however you want, to, whatever you want to call it. It expels gas uh, out of the rear of the rocket. So it expels gas. Uh, which has a mass of approximately one hundred kilograms. Now the gas is accelerated at two thousand meters per second. Okay. Two thousand meters per second squared. What is the final velocity? What is the final velocity of the rocket after the gas is expelled uh, if it takes two seconds to expel the gas? Well, we'll say if it takes one second to expel the gas. So near instantaneous. Well, <laughs> it's pretty pretty quick. One thousand one. It's all gone. All all one hundred kilograms of of gas has been accelerated at two thousand meters per second squared out the back of the rocket. Okay. So um, when the when the gas is is accelerated out of the back of the rocket, really you can kind of think of that as the rocket exerting a force on the gas to accelerate it. So let's start with that. Let's start by figuring out what force the rocket exerts on the gas to get it to get it out the back of the rocket uh, at 2000 meters per second squared. And so we'll denote that as F of R comma G, the rocket, the force of, of that the rocket exerts on the gas. Well, we know that that's going to be equal to the mass of the gas times the acceleration of the gas. Okay. The mass of the gas, we're told, is 100 kilograms. 
and it's accelerated at 2,000 meters per second squared, right? And so that force is around 200,000 newtons. Okay. And so since we know the acceleration of the gas, what we really want to do is kind of flip the problem because we're interested in the velocity of the rocket. And, and to get to that, we need to know the acceleration of the rocket. But if we know that the gas is accelerating at 2,000 meters per second squared, then we could figure out what the force that generates that acceleration must be. And that force is 200,000 newtons. Okay. So by Newton's third law, the force of the rocket on the gas is equal to the force of the gas on the rocket, right? And so really, we can put a negative sign there if we want. And so the implication here is that the force of the gas on the rocket is also 200,000 newtons. Now, negative, positive, whatever, I mean, we just need to figure out the magnitude and then we can set our coordinate system. All right, so the force that the gas exerts on the rocket is 200,000 newtons. Okay, remember, we're interested in the, in the motion of the rocket. We're not interested in the motion of the gas. We're just using the motion of the gas to figure out what it's doing to the rocket. So what's the free body diagram look like here? Well, it's real simple, isn't it? We've got a rocket, and it is got a very significant amount of force, uh, the force of the gas on the rocket. And that's equal to... 200,000 newtons, right? The, uh, the rocket has just expelled 100 kilograms of gas out the back of the rocket at 2,000 uh, meters per second squared, uh, it's, uh, and that equates to a force of about 200,000 newtons. Okay, so here's our free body diagram, very simple. There's really only one force. Again, there's no gravitational field, there's no normal force, there's no friction, we're in space, so it's really just the force that's being exerted on the rocket by the gas. So what is the rocket's acceleration? Well, using Newton's second law, we can see that the magnitude of the acceleration is going to be equal to the force, 200,000 Newtons, divided by the mass of the rocket, which is 500 kilograms. And so the acceleration is about 400 meters per second squared. All right. Now, the gas is expelled over a period of just a second, right? So it takes about a second for all the gas to um, to leave the, the rocket. And so what is the final velocity? So presumably, once the gas is all expelled, the acceleration stops, I, this force is, is no longer there, and the rocket is just under velocity. And so what is that velocity? Well, we can just use Vf. Final velocity is equal to the initial velocity plus the acceleration times the time. And so the initial velocity is 0 meters per second. And the acceleration we see is about 400 meters per second squared times 1 second. And so we get 400 meters per second. Okay. All right, very good. So that is another example of kind of, this one I like because it uses Newton's third law a little more explicitly, um, also Newton's second law, and Newton's first law because we know, of course, there's a net force based on this free body diagram. So all three, all three of Newton's laws are kind of wrapped into that kind of simple example. Okay. All right, I think that's where we'll end this section. Again, this is a slightly shorter uh, problems and examples section. Uh, and the reason it's shorter is only because the next entire chapter is about applying Newton's laws. And so we will see lots and lots of, of, of cool uses of these, of these laws of motion. Uh, and we'll learn a lot. We'll, we'll try to figure out new ways to apply them and, and kind of tackle some much more challenging problems. So we'll end it there, and we will talk to you all next time. Take care.